Okay, so we've got this new contract. Um, uh, our residents will be expecting you know, significant and substantial and measurable improvements, um, to particularly on you know the bane of our lives, on potholes, on the timing of their reporting and the quality, you know, everything right first time. Uh, the other element which drives out all of us mad is two pot, three potholes, two of which kind of meet the criteria. The one just next door just doesn't do it and it's left until the system brings it round again. So, you know, on behalf of one million Surrey residents, I, I'll, I'll ask the question, if you can, as specifically as you can, what are our residents going to see as demonstrable improvements to the road surfacing, to the stuff that drives them all mad as a consequence of this new contract? Okay, fabulous. That's no pressure on me then. So, um, <laughs> not at all, not at all. <laughs> what we we're very aware of the the sense around potholes from the public, and um, you know we live and breathe it, and and have looked at this so many times. So let me just start by just saying that we are very aware. So what we've tried to do is give a really clear focus for any provider who's coming to work with us that right first time, and we mean right first time. So turning up doing a permanent repair, doing a permanent repair that makes sense to people, that will last um, and is good value is what we're after. So we've been really clear in our messaging, that's the approach we're, we're after here. And what we've seen from the providers is, is some different solutions across the piece, but they all understand the right first time. We are looking at um, perhaps different options around different materials or different way of fixing um, defects. So that may mean um, kind of more environmentally, um, sustainable materials. It may mean um, different options to treat larger areas of repair. So uh, you're addressing your point of, you know, not just turning up to do one or the other um, and looking at how we best schedule doing that so that we aren't leaving defects on the network any longer than they need to. Now, um, this is an ever improving area and a, a, a subject we'll for, forever be looking at, I'm sure. So the demonstrable bit, I suppose, at the start, what we hope to see is some very clear um, changes in our uh, approach, which is thinking about the different materials and options we can and whether we can do more at the first visit. What we will need to do over time is to see how we can continue to improve that because we do have, you know, um, policies to consider the safety and risks and other factors like that. So sometimes that does get in the way of us doing everything we would want to at that first visit, but it, it won't be for the want of trying. So I'm hopeful um, that answers the question. We've It goes back to the right first time and how they might approach that. So, yeah. Thanks, Lucy. Chairman, sure, if, if I can. Um, sorry, Matt. Yeah, please. Sorry, Joe, but it, it also means that we do need to keep up our investment into the highway network sure. to stop the potholes appearing in the first place. So yeah. the fact that we are resurfacing so many roads and actually putting them back into the condition they need to be uh, for our higher level of traffic that we have on our highways, actually, then, as Lucy says, we need the right first time, but we also need to keep that level of investment Absolutely. in to prevent it happening in the first place. Absolutely. And, and this committee at, at, at budget time will be, uh, will be on the case and fully supporting you for uh, increased resources. Uh, Paul. Thank you. First of all, just want to uh, agree with everything that every, that's just been said so far, particularly what Matt's just said there. I think that the report is right to um, highlight and put emphasis on this right first time thing because it is so important. Um, however, there is more to um, our highways uh, maintenance than potholes. And I know that is key on people's minds. Uh, we had an enormous problem with it a few years ago. Uh, and I do believe it is getting better. I really do I love this AI technology that identifies it and all the rest of it, all great stuff. Um, but one of the, I just want to go back to some of the things that John O'Reilly said, uh, our beloved chairman, um, on, um, you know, the, the, the quality, quality control. Because with the best will in the world, with the best contractors in the world, that's not going to happen every time, getting it right first time. There are going to be, there are going to need to be subsequent visits and, and all the rest of it. Um, and, and I think really what residents say to me over and over again is um, how, what, what, what processes are in place to quality check these things, spot checks on the work and everything else. So 
uh, that's my first question. Can you tell me what exactly you intend to do in terms of quality checking? And that needs to be by highways officers, not the contracts themselves. They don't need to be marking their own work. We need to be doing it kind of thing. Um, so that's the, my, my first question. Oh, let's, um, let's answer, uh, Paul, let's answer, uh, let uh, the team answer your first question and then we'll go to your second question. Okay. Yeah, all right. Like, I'll, I'll answer that one if that's okay, Chairman and Paul. So um, we, we've got a number of measures built into some of our existing processes, which, but we are strengthening those. So as a starting point, the contractors are required to take photos of, of the work they're doing in, in progress. So when they arrive at the defect, so they will, we would have taken information when we recorded it in the first place, when it was inspected. We then um, require them to take a photo when they start often while they're doing the work so that we can get a view of what's happening so whether they're doing it properly halfway through and then when they finish to show that the work's been completed that information is recorded for every single defect that's repaired and is uploaded into the um, works ordering system and we have complete access to that so that's a complete open system to us to check we then have a dedicated team of officers in the compliance function that are pretty much solely focused on looking at the inspection process and the repair of defects. And so they will take a sample of those um, defects each month. And that's a random sample that we generate. So it's not provided to us as a curated list of his, his or our best, if you like. So we have complete access to that. And, and they're qualified um, inspectors themselves, so they can determine those things. So they'll do a, a, a series of desktop audits, but they'll also actually go out and physically check some of those sites as well to make sure they're done so it's a mixture of things and if we see a, a higher than expected number of poor quality things we will start to increase the the volume that we um sample but what we do with that information is that's then fed back straight into monthly meetings with the with the service provider teams that are doing the work to actually look at well what's going well because I, I i can't stress enough the importance of recognizing where things have gone well as much as we look at what's not worked, because then we can learn from what. So that's feeding in all the time. So and, and Paul, you talked about your belief that things have been improving. And so that's a contributing factor to that. Um, we also, as, as many of you all know, have, have a, a laboratory within the council who carry out testing. And so whilst a lot of their work will, to be fair, be led by the capital programmes, they do undertake some of the testing in relation to some of this work as well. So we, we've got that. I'd say that that's the processes we employ um, to, to drive that. And then the information is sort of fed up through the um, through the governance process as well. So we can see that at a, a, a higher tier of how we're performing on that. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Do you want me to come back on that next one yep. very quickly, John? Yep, yeah. Um, well, the, it says in the report, I forget which, which bit, about social value projects um i'd just be very keen to know because that that sounds really nice that's a nice buzzword but what does it actually mean and what will that look like thank you so i'll come in on this and and other colleagues might want to jump on so we were really keen one of our golden threads in the procurement was this wasn't just about you know business as usual fixing stuff one of the key themes we had in there was um how can we do more and social value and the greener futures and innovation and a few other things the kind of you know golden threads we've included so going to your question social value um, what we've asked each of the bidders to do is provide us some kind of examples of what what that might look like and then how it might grow over the years. So um, each are quite different. If I talk about some of the stuff that we're doing at the moment, then that helps to give you a flavour perhaps of what those things might be. So we have, for example, um, a kind of uh, a social skills um, training course at the moment with, with Kia, our current provider. So what that means is we engage with um, young adults who are kind of um, not in employment, education or training, and we um, offer them a placement a dedicated to training course for two weeks, I think two or three weeks, where they can get some kind of recognised highway um accreditation and then we can if they if they are successful and they they are so inclined and want to pursue it we can offer a placement on the contract or with one of our supply chain um so that's one example where we're kind of um, using the skills we have, if you like, to um, provide a wider social value. Other examples that the industry might have is um, like social enterprise um, arrangements. So um, there's a, a, you know, 
um, like sign making, you know, sort of these social enterprises where they are providing a service which we can then use. So the other kind of social value we have con um, done recently is um, set up the Surrey Infrastructure Academy. So this again is where providers have um, come together with Surrey educational facilities to develop a course, excuse me, um, to uh, offer training in the world of highways um, engineering so we can kind of um, educate the workforce for the future. So that's perhaps some examples of what we're doing at the moment. Some of those may well, we may see, you know, um, continuing um, in a different format, but there is a there's a big um, scope. As I said, we've we've asked them to think about what options can they do and very much what will end up within Surrey will be something which will be um, right for Surrey. So it's right that it develops when it arrives because we have, you know, different demographics. We have different issues that we might want to tackle. So um, it's it's much as about the framework that sits around it that we can then kind of use to the best of our ability. Apologies okay. for my dog. That's all great no, no, no. stuff. That's all great stuff, Lucy. Um, um, all I would say is it's, I think it's really important that we publicise those things um, and let the community know what we're doing. And I appreciated your dog there. Definitely a sign of our virtual times, and uh, really enjoyed that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I think we'll make. I think, I think we'll make the canine uh, a next witness, witness, so we can get good, 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 good answers from Lucy's hound. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, uh, he didn't put his hand up, but I'm going to call him anyway. Uh, Paul Deach, let you start off. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, now, uh, first of all, I'd just like to echo John's comments about the quality of this paper. It is excellent, I have to say. I was very much expecting when I started to read out the report to have my notepad um, and come into this committee meeting today as a, a critical friend, uh, as we are supposed to do in scrutiny. But I have to say, I think every single one of the areas that I've repeated over and over again in, in the various meetings where we talked about buses, um, you know, you've, you've, you've hit every single sweet spot. Um, and I'm going to repeat those for the benefit of residents that uh, may be watching this, because I think it is important that, um, and in particular, uh, a resident of my, uh, who I represent in Mitchett, Ma Maureen from Mitchett. I hope you're watching this or the recording afterwards because uh, she has made many representations to me over the years about the quality of buses and I couldn't agree with her more. But the things, if we are going to realistically encourage residents um, to get out of their cars and onto buses, and I think we are kidding ourselves if we don't touch upon all these five points um, if we, you know, if we're going to achieve that, and that is that they need to be more reliable. You've 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 talked about that in the report. They need to be more frequent. Uh, they, and, and really importantly, they need to be cheaper than driving and parking. Okay, um, they need to run later at night and run at weekends and holidays. And also vitally, they must connect communities. Okay, we don't do those things. We're wasting our time. So um, one of the things I will be asking for, though, in the recommendation, if I'm going to be critical at all uh, of this report, um, is that it doesn't really talk enough to my mind about the, 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 the one point I made there, cheaper than driving and parking. It touches on it, but I don't think it's strong enough, and we need to we, that needs to be a lot stronger. Um, but other than that, I think that um, uh, I'm quite happy with those points. Um, I'd just like to also talk about the real-time passenger information and the ticketing and stuff. That is really, really important. Of course, it is. The easier we make bus travel for residents, the more chance they are they're going to use it. Um, and I think that what I would like to see, because it mentions in there about the development of apps and, and web technologies and all the rest of it so that residents can get this real time information as well as the boards on the uh, bus stops. What I would like to see in the app, because I think more and more people will use an app when this when this comes about, is real time current location of the next bus. Right. Because with the best will in the world, we can get the bus is more reliable and more on time, but that there are many factors out of the control of the bus operators that um, 
like a traffic jam, for instance, an accident, whatever it may be, uh, that may slow the or, or make that bus late. Now, if a resident who stood at a bus stop expecting a bus to arrive in three minutes time can see actually on and then it's going to be late and can see on the app the real time location of the next bus. I think that will make lives much more convenient for residents. So the technology does exist for that to happen. So uh, I would like to see that included in any technology uh, going forward. Um, and then I've got, and then I'm going to finish with a question. What happens if we don't get this government funding? Because a lot of what we're talking about rides on getting that funding. What's our plan B? And what can we realistically expect to lose off this plan if we don't get that funding? Thank you very much. And well done to you all. What a great report. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Um, the submission we're going to be making to the government in the document in the BSIP will include requests for revenue support for all the various measures that we've been talking about, as well as capital uh, support as well for those items that need it, including those service enhancements you mentioned across the network. Um, the core principle of the new national bus strategy is to increase patronage. So I think we very much uh, accept and identify with those fundamental needs, uh, Paul, that you've mentioned there that residents want to see. We need to carefully consider, however, which areas or measures or initiatives will result in the largest increase in bus patronage because that is the core message the government's putting out in the new bus strategy and equally important will be that whatever measures we do implement or consider implementing are sustainable into the future uh, at some point, this government revenue support, this uh, part of this three billion pound England wide pot of money will cease. Uh, some commentators are looking at the life of this parliament, quote unquote. So what we don't want to do is invest in revenue funding for things like service enhancements that we could obviously have problems with in the future should the government funding stream stop. I'm not putting a dampener on our ambitions here because we are going to be as ambitious in all our proposals in our BSIP as we can in the knowledge that perhaps we won't get as much money as we would ideally need, but we will certainly get some. Uh, at this moment in time, I can't say how much we will get because we've got no information from DFT or any indication at all. But uh, but you're quite correct that uh, if we didn't get sufficient funding, we would have to scale back our ambitions. And I think we're going to be looking at a, a priority ranking, so to speak. For example, with service improvements, we'd have to establish a priority ranking so that if we didn't get all the funding, we could uh, deploy it where the most uh, value could be obtained in terms of increasing bus patronage. Um, we, um, we, we're we looking at having a sort of hierarchy system, if you like, for bus routes, category one, category two, category three. Obviously, category one routes are the most important ones, the ones that are key strategic services linking the major towns together and serving the communities in between, and the ones that do already carry the most patronage and provide the firmest platform on which to build. However, there are other equally important services for other communities at a category two level where we also plan uh, or will be writing up a number of enhancements to those services as well. Uh, but most patronage increase will occur on the key networks and that's where we will focus a lot of our other investment as well, such as bus priority measures on the key corridors at the pinch points. All the bus operators have been very helpful in coming forward with all their favourite pinch points on our network and the impact it has on their services. Uh, a key requirement of whatever we do is to improve reliability of bus services. Uh, people are more wound up about reliability of buses, will it come when the timetable says, than they actually are about level of service or, or fare. That's not to, uh, to diminish the importance of those things, but reliability is the key. And um, 
Uh, that needs to be targeted at the bus routes where it will most benefit. Uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, electronic data information on bus services, um, we've had a real-time information system for some time. We would like to see an expansion of on-street presence of that at selected locations, you know, the signs on the bus shelters and so on. In terms of um, having our own app or website, we did in fact have a website for a period of time a few years ago called Travel Smart. Um, but the uh, results in terms of upturn usage of that um, were not as clear as one might have thought. But the idea of a Surrey wide bus transport platform can be considered, but the cost of that needs to be weighed against what information is already available from open data sources. The government has a new system in place now called BODS, Bus uh, operational data system, which collects electronic data from operators on their schedules, fares and vehicle positioning and makes that data available to open platform suppliers. In other words, commercial suppliers who provide uh, the sort of um, websites and apps that you would look at on your mobile phone. And if you're going to look at something for a bus, I think a lot of people go to something like Google to start with, yeah, as a first port of call. Um, and that's where that data can be used by these suppliers to create such systems. So um, that's we must be careful that we don't duplicate what is all already available out there and is improving uh, regularly now through the government BODS initiative, which is now been in place for a year or so and is growing every day. Okay. okay. Thanks. Uh, if, if I can just, just quickly come back, John. Yeah, just two. We've got five others. Yeah, the uh, the uptake on the website that you mentioned. I mean, I remember that website. Um, I, I'm willing to bet good money that if we achieve our aim of getting people out of their cars and onto buses, that the uptake would be significantly higher. Um, you know, and um, on I take your point on the real time um, passenger information. Uh, thanks for that. But uh, all I would say is I'd like to see in the report can uh, an emphasis on uh, beg your pardon on the recommendation an emphasis on the uh, cheaper than driving and uh, parking that we really do need to bolster that in the recommendation. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Laurie. OK. That Thanks, John. Uh, thanks, Matt and Duncan as well. Um, I, again, I was pleasantly surprised to uh, read this report. There was a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, I think Matt knows, certainly in my county division, that speeding, at least in one of the villages, I represent three villages, Mitchett, Deepcut and Frimley Green, but certainly in Mitchett, uh, I would say that speeding-related issues or antisocial behaviour involving vehicles accounts for a very large part of my inbox communication from residents and the chatter on social media. Um, as far as average speed cameras are concerned, love all the stuff on that. I, I honestly don't think, or it is designed to be that we're going to get average speed cameras in the villages. I, don't, I, I recognize that just wouldn't be viable from a, a financial point of view, because, you know, obviously you've got to have a high volume, volume of traffic going through for them to be uh, viable. Uh, but I was very pleased to see the stuff on the spot camera uh, stuff. Um, but I, I do have a concern and I've written this down. So I'm going to read it out because because it's that important. I don't want to um, cock it up. So, um, so I have a concern about the implementation of spot cameras only when highway engineering improvements are considered first. Uh, often highways engineering improvements cost vast <laughs> sums of money much more than a camera might cost or what I have available in my members' highways allocation. And often the budgets just don't exist to solve the problem through engineering. Um, I see this as being an infinite loop situation where nothing gets done about a problem. So yes, the policy about uh, the introduction of this spot cameras is good, but I think that we are in a we might be faced with a situation where we're just not going to get anything achieved because of that one element there and i would like that addressing please um i see this yeah if, if i'm yeah certainly um the police 
I've, I've been nego- we've been negotiating with the police on this policy uh, for for a few weeks, and uh, their concern would be a proliferation of lots of cameras all over the place. And if they were to be introduced where there are other measures that could solve it, then they are going to be inundated with lots more work and lots more penalties. And it's not quite right what you said that, you know, we only put them in uh, locations where we can think we can make some money and, and pay for it. Actually, we don't want the penalties. We're inundated with the penalties. We can't, I didn't we can't cope. Sorry, then, if I, if I misunderstood, but the concern is we, we didn't... Um, you know, the, having too many cameras at location, too many locations is not something that the police would support because they would not be able to cope with the volume of offences, but also uh, they would perhaps lose, there's the danger of losing public support for cameras as well, um, whereas where they should be used as a road safety tool at the locations that really need them. Therefore, if, if it's a, a low um, traffic tr- residential road where traffic calming is eminently viable, uh, the police would say no to a camera because otherwise they have an enduring task of uh, issuing penalties and prosecutions to drivers, including court prosecutions, which the money for which don't, doesn't come back to pay pay for the camera partnership, and it clogs up the courts and, and so on and so forth. And that's not a good use of public resources to try and tackle this problem compared to a, a one-off, perhaps more expensive, but a one-off uh, uh, investment in, in traffic calming. Instead, there, there are locations around the county, perhaps on, say, the A25, where in some villages traffic calming just wouldn't be viable. You know, it's a major road. It's a, it's a diversion route for the M25. Uh, and you wouldn't be looking to put traffic calming where there are all those HGVs going past close by to residential properties. Those are the kind of locations where the police are saying, well, we've been enforcing there for decades with a camera va- man, you know, a camera, va- camera van and or police pol- officers pulling people over. That's where they see that, that cameras could play a part, even if there hasn't been a huge history of collisions. OK, I would like to come back very briefly, please, John. Um, yep. So, yeah, just one of the comments that you made there um, about, you know, the police, if they think that there is a, a viable option for traffic calming, um, then then the cameras wouldn't be a recommendation. And I understand that. The, the point I'm trying to make is that, yes, there are locations where traffic calming would make, um, would be good. But with just isn't the funds available to provide that tra- those tra- traffic calming measures. Hence my infinite loop um, comment that we're just we're just in a cycle of not getting anything done. And that is you've just demonstrated adequately to me there that this in in a lot of cases is just not going to solve any problems. So we need to address that, and I'd like to see that addressed in the uh, recommendation, please, uh, Chairman. Thank you. Thanks, Paul.